because I know it triggers people when they see stuff going up in smoke. I'm putting on this opening just to boil your blood. I have a Toshiba. This time it's a DVR620 combo VHS recorder and DVD recorder. This one here was sent in from a viewer that didn't pack it very well. It got a little bit of damage uh, and it shuts down after 10 seconds. Let's see what's going on. So I received a package from Birmingham, Alabama to uh, look at a piece of equipment. It says VCR side will accept tape and actually start to play for about 10 seconds and then it will stop and the machine will cut off. When the machine is restarted, the VCR will eject. So this is what how it came in the box. Oh, you guys can't see this, but here's how well this unit has been packed. Do you think I'm going to find things floating around inside? I don't know that this unit is even going to be fixable because it sure looks like the post office played football with it. Take a look over here. There's a bend in the cover here. I have this is my first inspection. You got a little sticker that says at NorCal 715. <laughs> I guess that's an internet guy, a YouTuber. Um, hmm, I don't know why that's stuck on there. Anyway, this is um, how the unit came out. It's Toshiba. This is how it's packed. Like, was that bubble wrap at one point that exploded? I think those were the air pockets that exploded on it. I mean, totally inadequate packing. What a joke. Like that needed a box twice that size with proper packing around it. Um, this is the machine here. It's a DVR 620 Toshiba DVD recorder. Plus an dash R and RW. VHS player. Sounds like something's loose inside the unit. Let's get the top off it and see what damage has been done. As you can see, it's obviously had an impact on this side. You can see that the cover is dented and warped right there. So I don't know what to expect once I get into this machine. have the classic mode switch problem on them so they all have it's uh, basically it's a funai deck i think this one's a funai it looks like it Let's see if anything falls out of it i heard something rattling around when i was uh, moving it before so maybe something's going to fall out of it when i give it a shake Hopefully the board's not broken, and hopefully, oh, they, oh yeah, this is, there's some plastic here that's broken, I don't think that's serious, so that's just part of it, that's just part of the tab that holds the front panel on, so that might be okay. Let's plug it in and see whether it does anything first of all, it turns on, and uh, see what it's doing. Okay, at least it lights up, it says load on the front. First things first, I go to plug in my audio video connector and realize that there's a pin that's broken off. Can't plug it in, so that's the first thing I gotta fix is I gotta get the pin that snapped off. You can see it inside the plug. I gotta get that out. That's first. So we'll try to push it through from the other side. There should be a hole in the back here. I may be able to push this through. There it is. Pin broke off from a video cable. So he's going to have to replace his video cable because it's now broken. 
Okay, let's plug this in and see whether it, what it does. I know it doesn't work for any time it plays for 10 seconds. So that could be a number of things. Could be the take-up spools not turning properly. Could be a number of things. But let's find out what's going on first. Power the unit up. Get the welcome screen. Oh, here's some other things that are broken on the front here. Get the button here on the front. It's jammed. Wonder if it still works. It seems to click. And select VCR or DVD. That works. I like the buttons on the front. Just stop, play, and record. On the VCR side, we've got rewind, fast forward. Stop eject, play and record. There's no tuner in this, obviously. This was after the tuners were made. 2014, so this is actually a late model. See mine, I think mine I've got are like a 2012 model. And earlier ones had a tuner in them, but once all of the um, analog broadcasting went away, there was no point in putting a tuner in them anymore, so they just dropped that, made it strictly to transfer tapes back and forth. So I'm going to load a tape and observe what it does. Tape loads. Tape threads. Tape plays. And the reels are turning so it's not a mechanical problem. And it stops and then it shuts down. If I try to turn it back on, it's going to give me an error that the rotation sensor is not working. It's got an R on the screen. So uh, more than likely one of the rotation sensors here, uh, it's more than likely right here. Rotation sensor on this is done from picking up a signal from the infrared LED. It also won't detect if the tape's at the end, guaranteed. So let's just watch what happens. If I try to load a tape, and I'll rewind it, I'll stop it. Oops, hit the eject button. Rewind the tape here. And what will happen is, when the tape gets to the end, it's gonna hit the end, it's not gonna stop. And it's gonna go into a, it might even, it, it might even stop before it gets to the end of the tape. Yeah, it will. And then do the same thing but if I get the tape back to the beginning what's going to happen is it's going to uh, it's going to detect it's not going to detect the tape end sensor because the light has failed guaranteed we can confirm that I can put my camera on there and we'll see if we get any light from it but let's just see if it'll rewind back to the beginning of this tape the tapes almost at the beginning so I'm expecting it to uh, hit the end Okay, so it is detecting that the tape's at the end. So it could be the photo detector on the bottom is bad because it does detect that the tape is at the end, right? Oops, I hit eject. But it is detecting that the light, there's light from here. And if I turn on the infrared capabilities of my camera, we should see it. Now, whether it's not bright enough or whether it's the little photo sensor, down below that's at fault. Turning on night shot you can see that the infrared is blasting out a signal. Let me just kill some other lights in here so we can see if there's light. There should be light coming down this light pipe onto there. We should be able to see it if I kill the lights. So you can see the light. So that shines a light down and you can see the light below here if I something below there you should be able to see the reflection off the paper for example you can see it shining on the paper there if I can get this piece of paper below here you should be able to see the light shining off that little light pipe as well you see there now you can see it makes it a little easier so the infrared light is there it might not be strong enough but it also could be the photo transistor below could even just be dirty and not receiving the signal 
first thing I'll do is I'll remove the light pipe. It might help if I use the right size screwdriver. Make sure that this is clean because of course if it was dirty you wouldn't get the right amount of light but more importantly down here through this hole there's a photo transistor down there and well that transistor could have that photo transistor could have failed but it also could just have dirt that's built up on top that's obscuring the light or the solder connection below may have gone bad so we'll first try cleaning that off and then we'll test it again and see whether we get any different results I think I was pointing at this, that's the photodiode, the phototransistor is the one that's down in the hole there, black colored one. And what can happen is, if you get dirt and dust on there, it can block the signal enough, or it could be this transit, or this photodiode is just getting weak and the signal's not strong enough. So it's very possible that the emitter is also just getting a little bit too weak. If I plug it in now, you should see that light lighting up bright. Well, I'll have to put it in a night shot to do that. but. There it is, you see, in night shot. So the infrared output is working. It's just that the signal's not being received. As the reel rotates and this turns, it blocks the signal. So you got an on-off switching. That's how it tells if the rotation is working, the rotation sensor is working. And it's giving me an R on the screen, which indicates the rotation sensor has failed. So we'll start out by trying to clean that and see if that works. Otherwise, we'll have to look at replacing, start with the infrared emitter. That's the first one to change because if it gets weak, it won't work. But typically when this gets weak, it won't detect the end of the tape either because that same light is being used to, to operate the phototransistors on either side here for stopping the tape at the end. So if it goes bad, it'll typically affect everything. But it might be just starting to get a bit weak and just because the light has to get directed a different direction to go over to here it might just be a little bit on the weak side but we'll try cleaning it first and see what happens because a lot of times it's just like a smoke film if it's in a house where someone smokes for example smoke film can get onto the surface and reduce the light output a bit so i'm just going to clean this with isopropyl and alcohol on the end of the future. Put it down there and give it a spin. And we'll do the same to the, the LED. And of course, we'll clean the underside of the little light pipe, just to make sure it's clean. and then replace. Now it sits in a specific position. There's two little locator holes that lock it in the correct position because obviously if it wasn't in the right position it's not going to work. And then uh, we'll put the screw back in. And power the unit up and try it again and see if it still stops as it's trying to play or fast forward, rewind, etc. My light is getting annoying. The power cable for my light is hanging right over, over my plug. All right, power. play and we'll play for more than 10 seconds we'll find out pretty quick <clears throat> I rest my case dirt could have been dust 
because it's sitting inside. So if it's if it's if it was sitting for a period of time and dust got in there and settled on there, could have been environment smoke, for example, from smoking cigarettes or other things, or or from cooking, right, or a fireplace. But there you go, it's fixed. That was it. And I'll let you guys in on a little secret. This is the first time I've ever seen this happen. So someone says, oh yeah, well, you see that all the time. No, I don't. This is the first time I've actually seen that happen. I was expecting it to be the, the either the LED. Well, I was expecting the LED to be bad. That's why I rewound the tape to the beginning to see if it would hit the end of the leader and jam and then stop. But it didn't, it triggered it at the end. So I knew, okay, it's got light, right? That's the first thing I thought was, okay, it's not getting light. And uh, as you can see, my lights in here don't affect this one because I'm I'm running, uh, I'm not running uh, incandescent lights that emit infrared. I'm running LEDs which don't emit a lot of infrared light, and these are quite specific. If I were to shine something with infrared, I might even be able to. If I hit my remote control, I bet I might be able to trigger the. Uh, if it's on the same frequency range, I might be able to trigger an end of tape. <laughs> I just triggered rewind. <laughs> um, see, Go back to play. My infrared remote. I just pushed a button on my infrared remote. I just pointed that right here, and watch. I'll do it again. Uh, where was it here? I gotta hold, hold it right down here, it's right at the angle. And uh, it triggered rewind. There we go goes into rewind. If I do it on this other one over here, if I make it stop, I just made it stop. Obviously it's, it, the machine is set so that because, it, because it's got no record tap, these machines had what's called a rental mode. So what they would do is when the tape got to the end, it would rewind and then when the tape gets back to the beginning, it would it should kick the tape out, I think. Yeah. It ejects the tape at the beginning. But you see that feature only works if the tape has reached the end. If I uh, if I let it if I stop it, for example, and press rewind, it'll just stop, it won't eject the tape. Right? But if the tape reaches the end, which I can play, if I hit the remote sensor here with IR and make it rewind, now when it hits the end, it'll rewind, it'll eject the tape. On this machine here, looks to be in good shape now. Just a bit of dirt on here. Uh, the guy does want me to check out the DVD portion, so I'm going to go grab a DVD rewritable disc because I don't want to uh, make a permanent copy of this. And then we'll check out the DVD drive. So let me go grab a, a recordable disc and we'll verify that it works too. All right, so I've got a remote control for my own Toshiba that will control this. I've actually got two DVR, I got three DVR7s, three Toshiba DVD recorders and three DVR-7s and a another one that I forget the model of it um, is it DVR-9 maybe? DVR-5 I forget anyway um, it, it'll play Super VHS tapes I doubt that this one will but I've got one that will play Super VHS tapes and record of course onto DVD but I only got like two remotes one for the combo unit and one for the that other one maybe three remotes but they sent they tend to control all the units, most of the features. So let's, uh, first of all, let's put this disc in. This is just a disc I use for testing. It's a rewritable DVD. This is DVD-R, this one. I have some plus R's as well, but I'll try it on this dash R. This is just one of my test discs that I use for testing equipment. It's blank. So I'll load up the disc. So if I press the record mode button, it'll tell me how many hours 
it will record for. One, two, four, or six hours or eight hours. I load the tape in and I just press the dubbing button. It will automatically play the tape and record it onto the disc. So I'll just let this thing record for this, this lame recording. And then we'll finalize the disc and make sure that it's uh, capable of uh, finalizing the disc. And then I'll unfinalize and erase the disc. And uh, then we should be done with this one. Clean the heads, of course. But there it is recording. Not really much to see other than the tape turning and the DVD is in its drive. It's interesting that it uses the Panasonic chipset on here. That's the MPEG encoder and one of the reasons that these machines produce such a spectacular picture on DVD. But saying that, these were pretty reliable machines. Again, I've got a DVR-7. I can't tell you how many tapes has been through that machine. It's it's in the thousands. I've, I've probably recorded a thousand DVD-Rs on it or pretty darn close to it because I do tape archiving for clients. And that's the machine I use for all the VHS and all the um, VHS-C get used on that machine. I use it for uh, when I'm recording uh, from Digital 8, for example, because it's got the, the DVD or the DV input. It's got the Firewire input on it. So I record everything. Uh, high 8 and, and uh, it, Video 8 go into my Digital 8 player and then feed out from the Firewire into one of my two Toshibas. I usually use the DVR-7 for the VHS stuff and I use the, I think it's a DR-420. That's the one I usually use for uh, stuff off of 8mm. That's just because when clients bring me tapes, usually I'll get a mix of either DV and, and uh, 8mm high 8 or digital 8 and VHS. They'll bring me both. So I'll generally have their VHS stuff dubbing on one of these machines and I'll be using either the DV player or the digital 8 player to play analog high 8, analog 8, high 8, and D digital 8, and of course a DV player to play uh, the DV tapes. And HDV goes right over to the computer for clients that want stuff on DVD, which is uh, not as much as they used to. I used to get a lot more clients wanting stuff on DVD than today, but I still get a fair number of people that want stuff archived onto disk just as a backup. The recording is finished, press the stop button and it'll just finish writing to disk and then I can finalize it. Since this is such a short recording, it's going to take it quite a while to finish this up. That's the thing with uh, burning to DVD is uh, the lead out was so long that they recorded. So it's written to disk now. It's now done the, the end of the session. But if I hit record again, it would just start another session. But if I want to finalize this, I can go into setup, DVD menu, finalize, and now finalize the disc. This will take a few minutes and it will make this disc compatible with regular DVD players. These units all have a fan because they get quite warm when the DVD burner is running. So they all have a fan on them to keep them cool and that fan is supposed to be running at all times and it's not. Oh, it's trying, it's stuck. Oh, I think there's something stuck in there. I have to take that apart, now it's spinning. I think there was something stuck in the fan, maybe some plastic that broke off when it was dropped, when it was shipped, and that fan was stuck, but as you can see, now it's spinning. It's 3% complete on this finalizing. This is ridiculous. If it was a full disc, if I'd recorded a full hour or two hours on the disc or whatever, it would finalize in probably 30 seconds, but because I only recorded five minutes or less than five minutes, it's um, gonna take forever to finalize the disc. It's ridiculous, but that's the way it is. We'll take a look at the disc once it's final. It's 4% done. We'll take a look at the disc once it's finalized. You'll see it'll look like half the disc is written to because it's going to write a huge, long lead out session. I'm going to have to replace my good old workshop heater because they've recalled all of these units, even though mine was a Canadian made one and they, they make them now in China. This one was made in Canada, but apparently the date range falls into a recalled batch for the heating element catching on fire. I don't know how a heating element can catch on fire in something that's made out of metal, but uh, I guess it could shower sparks or something. 4.8 kilowatt 240 volt garage heaters if you've got one of these ones 
uh, take, just take a look for the Canadian recall. If you've got one, there's a recall or telling people not to use it. I might risk it and use it, but uh, otherwise I'll have to replace it. Otherwise I'll freeze out here in the winter. All right, this thing is finished finalizing. If we open the disc drawer up, and take a look at the disc. You can see how much of it the disc get finalized. Can we see it here? This disc has been used before, so it might be kind of hard to see it, but it, it, it recorded all the way out to here. You can, you can see the color change if we zoom in. You can see the, the different shade here. So that's where it recorded out to when it finalized the disc. This disc in, initially has been recorded out that far because the recording starts from the middle and works its way out. Let's uh, play it back and make sure that it, it uh, works. And there indeed it is finalized. It says recording one was from the VCR, it was done in the XP speed. And there's the recording. In North America. And the recording itself is indistinguishable from the original. Now I'm going to try making a recording from the line input. This time I'm recording at the SB speed. I'll let this one run for a few minutes and we'll check the disc out. I'm playing it back this time on my wall mounted open chassis DVD player that I use as a test source using the AV outputs. As you can see, that one spins. You can actually see the laser shining through the disc being copied onto this DVD-RW disc. I don't have a plus RW uh, kicking around. I guess I could use one of the mini discs from my camera. But um, I don't have any plus RW discs to record on at the moment, so I just have to limit it to testing it with dash RW. I'll also test it with a direct digital input from my Digital 8 camera. This is one of my oh, this is a TRV240. DCR TRV240 with the Firewire out using the nice old vintage Sony Firewire on each end. And this is the type of Firewire that you really need. You don't want the monster cable stuff that's really thick because the problem with the heavy monster cable Firewire was it was so stiff that it provided a lot of torque. When you put the camera on your countertop for example if the cable was hanging down the weight of the cable on here could uh, bend the connector enough to damage it so that's why the Sony cable was the preferred one to use because it was the right gauge of wire without being heavy to transfer high-speed data so I'm just gonna play the tape back here got this one on video 3 now and I'll hit record on this side and make the recording as soon as the recording starts here okay record this is an aquarium that I did a video of years ago. This one's not my aquarium. This is before I set my tank up. I was looking at other people's and filming them. And uh, anyway, saw this one set up in a fish store and set my camera up and just recorded it. Got to know the owner of the aquarium shop and he agreed to let me come into the store after the cl store closed for the evening and uh, just make a recording of the fish and um, make a video from it. So. That was that. There's also stuff on here from uh, the uh, Vancouver Aquarium also on this tape. This was one, a tape that I made and actually sold copies on DVD many, many years ago. This is the original tape that was edited together that I sold uh, copies on, on DVD. Sold them on eBay for $9.95 a pop and sold literally hundreds and hundreds of copies of this, uh, this video. So anyway, I'm just going to use this as a quick test to test the recording capabilities using the DV input. I should point out that this tank here was actually set up at Big Al's Aquarium in Richmond. And that's the shop that I bought my aquarium equipment at many years ago when I set mine up. And I was uh, in there shopping to, for equipment and he had this nice tank set up at the front of the store. So I said, geez, I'd love to come in here with my camera and just record this. So I went in there, this was shot on a, a DCR VX1000 three chip uh, Sony. A mini DV camera is what this one was shot on back when I did this and this would have been uh, oh at least uh, at least 20 years if not more but more than 20 years probably more like 25 years ago because that shop hasn't been around for probably 20 years but they did have a nice display tank set up that was uh, very nice and well this is it and before anybody asks no this tape is not this, this video is not up on YouTube. I do have other aquarium videos. I've got my own aquarium video up on YouTube 
fine. I've got some, I think I got the Vancouver Aquarium up there as well. This particular one is not. One, because it wasn't shot in high definition, so I didn't think the quality was good enough, but uh, two, because the music I used on here is not royalty free. So if I were to play this on YouTube, I'm sure that it would pull a copyright match within seconds. Um, I did sell copies of it though on DVD for years and never had an issue with that, but they were being sold to private individuals. They weren't being put up on YouTube or anything on social media, so didn't have to worry too much about that then. But this is just a, some music I found uh, on a CD that I use. So that's why I'm kind of talking over it. I don't want the sound to be too loud because if it is, it will probably pull a copyright match. But I'm just going to record this long enough so that um, we can um, get a recording and see how this machine records once I finalize the disc from the lineup. But we know that it works copying video from the VHS. I just want to see how it looks from a good quality source. And this is about as high a quality of source as I can give it off of a mini DV. Well, this was a digital eight, but Digital Aid and Mini DV were identical as terms of in terms of uh, picture quality. They both recorded the same signal. I I shot on uh, Mini DV, but I edited and exported to Digital Eight, which kind of I think probably gives me a time frame for this because um, Digital Eight came around around 1999, so that's probably about the time that I did this recording. Is this disc when I made it was around 1999. Although I was I was dubbing it onto DVD, so I had DVD equipment back then, and I was selling copies of it on DVD at the time. Had this on for the first, uh, I think it was the first half of the disc, or first 45 minutes or so of the disc, I forget how long it was, but had this on for the first part of the disc, and then it had uh, uh, Firelog on as chapter two. So you bought a disc and you got the aquarium, and you got the Firelog for 10 bucks. And I did that, I'd say back in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, and on eBay, sold literally hundreds upon hundreds of copies at $9.99 a pop, plus five bucks shipping. Of course, that was before YouTube, right? But back then, that's how we did it. We, we had a video that we wanted to sell. We sold physical copies. Now we're into the Vancouver Aquarium. I actually, I should put this, uh, I, actually, I should put this video up, but should just change the music because I actually got some pretty good visuals on this tape. I should, I should put this together and put it up onto uh, YouTube. I forgot how good this tape was. I spent a lot of time. I spent like five hours in the aquarium one day filming this. It's tough when you're at the public aquarium trying to get shots where there's not reflections from other people that are in there, people taking flash photography and stuff that reflect off the tank. It's really quite uh, time consuming to kind of wait around and, okay, I've got 30 seconds to shoot before the next group of tourists walk through. Especially when you've got a relatively big camera and you got a tripod, right? Everybody else is just walking through with their little point-and-shoot cameras and taking some pictures of their kids and stuff, right? And uh, then someone comes in there with a big camera with a tripod on there and sets up and camps in front of the aquariums and films the fish. It's uh, Today they would probably not allow that to happen because they'd think someone was in there to try to make money off the aquarium. That fish doesn't look too healthy, does he? Kind of sitting on the bottom there. Little yellow tangs. This time I got two titles on it. Title one from line one at SP and title two from the DV input. Let's play the input or line one input, SP input. This is a recording from my DVD player on the line one input as you can see the picture on it looks great looks good as the original and the original doesn't look as good as the original that it was made on because this was all shot in 4k but the dvd looks as good as a dvd can look and this looks pretty much identical to the dvd copy everything's looking good here the dvd is playing back flawlessly let's go to the next uh, title so if I hit, uh, where is it, on disc menu, that should take me back to this main title. I can select title number two to turn the sound down on this one because uh, this one here will, I'm sure, draw attention if I let that music play. But here's a DVD copy directly off of a DV tape. 
so the DVD recorder is actually doing the the transcoding because a DV tape is recorded using a fixed 5 to 1 compression and the color space is 411 the color space for DVD is 420 MPEG-2 IPB compression and it's this is recorded at SP speed which would be 5 megabits Anyway, I would say that this machine is fixed. Everything's working. The VCR is working. The DVD recorder is working. Everything appears to be back to normal. Lucky it wasn't damaged during transport. I still have to deal with that fan because that fan was sticking. So let's fix the fan. Fan's held in place by three screws. Find on the back of this unit it has uh, HDMI out. This is for the DVD drive only, obviously. It has um, DVD and VCR. It has S video out, audio out, uh, digital audio out for the DVD, of course. Component out. I don't know whether the component out actually works from the VCR or only from the uh, DVD. Because some of them, this one says DVD slash VCR so it might it might have component output from the VCR as well but it's hard to say I'd have to try it let's see what's wrong with the fan why it was sticking let's unplug it if I can find the connector and maybe just push the fan out and see if there's a piece of plastic or something stuck on it it was like something was physically sticking the fan so maybe maybe a piece of plastic got into it and jammed it out oh, there it's unplugged now don't see anything there It was definitely stuck. Oh, maybe this is it here. I bet you this is what was in the fan. This fell out of it. You think? You think that's what jammed the fan? Probably a pretty good chance. Where did it come from? Hmm. Hard to say. But uh, definitely that fan was not turning before. It was stuck. And I flipped it a bit and it started turning. So I think that those pieces of plastic probably came from here. Because there's a piece broken right there. Uh, when this thing was bashed around, there's some more over here around this front piece here that holds the front cover on. This is broken and that's broken. I think that's what those plastic pieces are from. They made their way into the fan and jammed the fan. Okay, so it uh, looks like the fan's going to work, so let's just throw it back together and uh, we'll get this one out of here. Now the reason I'm not taking this all apart to get to the mode switch is there's no indication that the mode switch is causing trouble. And mode switches won't cause trouble if you use your machine. Right? If you use your VCR on a regular basis, and I don't mean you have to watch every program on VCR, obviously not, but if you turn your VCR on and you load a tape and you go through all the functions, play, stop, fast forward, rewind, forward search, reverse search, eject. If you do that once a month on your VCR, the mode switch is never going to go bad because what keeps them in tip-top shape is the polishing action of the contacts rotating around or sliding back and forth depending on whether it's a linear or a rotary encoder. That's what keeps them clean. If you do that on a regular basis you won't have to worry about them being cleaned. Now this looks like somebody's had this apart because someone's marked the uh, the ribbon connectors with a little tab on there as if they couldn't remember which one went where which is really not that difficult because I believe they're different sized slightly. But um, as an old trick that we used to do is we would mark them so we know which one went where. So this one's obviously been serviced at some point, but it's working, it's recording, it's playing, it's finalizing the disc, no problem. Again, I use the DVD-RW, which are typically harder to record to than a regular right once disc. That's the acid test for any of these drives. If they'll record, and play a rewritable disc then the drive is good the laser is good because laser could be getting weak and it would write to a regular DVD-R or plus R but it would not write to a dash RW that's just the way that if you're testing your drive 
if it'll record to a rewritable disk, the laser's fine. Because it takes a lot more power to write to a rewritable disk than it does a regular disk. Rule of thumb. Anyway, this was done. I guess I can clean the heads on it. And uh, we'll get this one packed up and ready to go. And I will pack it a little bit better than it was packed when it was shipped in. We'll clean the heads with some alcohol. Oh, actually, the heads were quite dirty on this. Wow, I wasn't expecting that much to come off them. Wow, that's pretty bad. Okay, let's just uh, clean the... audio head as well. And all the guides while it's here. And the lower drum. I move the heads out of the way when I'm running around the lower drum so as not to uh, touch the video head with the Q-tip because that could damage it. But there, it's clean. I'll make one final test of playback and then I'll throw this one together. There we go. This is the VHS recording of the California coast. Same uh, that's on the DVD. In fact, this tape was made from that DVD, which was made from the 4K original source that I shot. I think this 20, 2018 maybe. I think I shot this in 2018 or 2019. 2018 was when I did this one. I think it was 2018, maybe 2017. I went down there two years, right? Went down the coast two summers in a row. Did the Oregon coast one year and then did the Oregon California coast the next year. And that was the last time I was down there. Ended up in Las Vegas. That was, um, that was a mistake, let's just say. I think I went over this before, but due to a major F up by Trivago, I think it was Trivago. The one that pulls all of the sites. I was booking my rooms every night when I figured out how far I was going to get. And um, what those bastards do, and they don't tell you this, so I'm telling you, they put a $1,000 deposit hold on your credit card every night. It doesn't matter whether you're staying in a $1,000 hotel room or you're staying in a $69 Motel 6. They put a $1,000 hold on your credit card, which takes five days to drop off. And the problem that happened was I was paying for my trip on one credit card and I was using one that I don't normally use just for the bookings. So there was no charges whatsoever on this card. It had a zero balance. But the booking companies were putting a thousand dollar charge that was held for five days before the charge dropped off. And that's US dollars. And the card that I had I think had a maybe a eight or nine thousand dollar limit on it that I was not using. But after five days, when converted to Canadian funds, it was over the limit. And I booked my hotel in Las Vegas, got my confirmation number, but then it came up declined. And they had no way to contact me because I didn't have a cell phone. I wasn't going to pay for roaming charges, so I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have access to text messages or anything. I didn't have access to email other than when I was connected to public Wi-Fi. And I wasn't connected all day. I booked my place and then I left. So I'm on the road. So I got to Vegas and there was no rooms because there was a tournament going on. A poker tournament was going on, which I didn't know about. And every room was in the 800 to thousand dollar a night range, which is a little bit beyond my budget. So yeah, it was, uh, let's just say it was a fun, 
vacation trying to find a place to stay in Vegas when everything sold out because there was a big poker tournament going on and even the rooms that you would even the places where you would rent them by the hour were still 500 bucks a night which is what I ended up paying 500 bucks for a shithole of a, a hotel or motel one that would be popular with the two-hour rentals basically <laughs> I could go into details on that but let's just say the TV that was mounted up on the wall had this giant like 80 inch TV. It was a nice room, right? It was a really nice place as far as as far as the actual establishment went. It was but it was the type that would be rented to a few hours at a time because the TV got one channel and only one channel and I'll let you use your imagination to what was on the channel and let's just say it was not the Discovery Channel. We'll leave it at that. Anyway, this one's fixed. As you see, the VCR is playing fine. The problem with it shutting off after 10 seconds was just some debris or dirt on that rotation sensor. If you've got that problem with one of these ones, check that first because that is uh, that's the first for me. But it was pretty obvious when the message came up that rotation sensor wasn't working. It had a little R on the, on the display, which meant that it had shut down. So it was pretty obvious it was a rotation problem. Some machines use a rotation sensor underneath the real tables. Sometimes it's magnetic, other times it's optical. In this case, it's optical and it's driven right from that gear there. And that gear works both, I think, in, in well, even when it's in rewind, right? When it's in rewind, the, the, the uh, other hub is turning, but when the tape is rewinding, obviously this one's freewheeling, so it's driven off the take up. So, remember that one. You've seen it here first. I don't know if anybody else has discovered that problem before. I've never seen that fault with it being dirty before, but you saw what I did. I cleaned the photo transistor and the LED and the bottom of this little light tower. That fixed the problem. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.